Welcome back to the second presentation for today's subject, which is the law of time, the cyclic order. You will notice on your program that you've been given for the seven days that there will always be a presentation of the context in the morning, and then in the afternoon we will talk about the tool. So this morning we reviewed the whole understanding of 1260 time, how we have been trapped within the frame of the Gregorian calendar, and of linear time, where we are always moving through uh, the pa from the past into the future as we perceive it. So this afternoon, we will be speaking about the 13 moon calendar and the calendar change peace plan. But before we begin, Votan read this morning from the words of Christ, and I would like to begin this afternoon reading from the Holy Quran, Surah 7, and I will read simply the first seven verses. Surah 7, The Heights. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, Alif Lam Mim Sad, this scripture has been revealed to you. You shall not harbor doubt about it in your heart, that you may warn with it, and to provide a reminder for the believers. You shall all follow what is revealed to you from your Lord. Do not follow any idols besides him. Rarely do you take heed. Many a community we annihilated. They incurred our retribution while they were asleep or wide awake. Their utterance when our retribution came to them was, Indeed, we have been transgressors. We will certainly question those who received the message, and we will question the messengers. We will inform them authoritatively, for we were never absent. And from the dynamics of time, each day the reading from the dynamics of time comes from the code number of the day, which is seven, and the tone for the day, which is seven. So I read from the dynamics of time, 7.7. .7. In the telectonon, the use of the recharge crystal integrates the primal crystalline order into the telepathic biological functionings regulated by and open to celestial harmonics. The purpose of the identification and mapping of the celestial harmonics of the telectonon through telepathic applications, such as the Rinri Project Telepathic Circumpolar Rainbow Bridge Experiment, is to restore balance between AC and CA functions. This is also referred to as the magnetic re-education of humanity. Hello again. Um, I know there's few people who came in who late who weren't here uh, earlier this morning and uh, early, earlier today. And I just wanted to begin by reviewing a couple points. Um, the first was I'd like to review again the statement from the text Time and Morality, um, establishing a Babylonian source for Hindu and Mayan chronologies. He's got it backwards, but the statement's interesting. The accurate measurement of time is a measure of the intelligence of man. A sense of the importance of time is a measure of man's morality. That is a key statement that underlies um, everything that we have to say regarding the law of time. We also um, gave the definition, the, what we might call the official definition of a calendar, which is totally based on the Gregorian calendar and could only have come about by relying on generations of use on the Gregorian calendar. And that is that the function of a calendar is to um, coordinate the movement, the apparent movement of the sun with the movement of the earth to establish the exact length of the 
tropical year, which is this horrendous number up there, 365.2442199 days. So, and that the purpose of that is to establish dates and that the official uh, commission on time, which is the, the official commission of time for our planet, uh, relies on this definition uh, of the calendar and that the this definition of a calendar absolutely separates time from consciousness, it absolutely separates time from the mind, and therefore absolutely separates time from morality, and is the basis of what we refer to as the 1260 human disorder in time. That uh, from the analysis of the, of the law of time, that the human uh, species and its civilization, its dominating civilization at this uh, point uh, have uh, by following uh, a calendar that is erroneous, illogical, irrational, and is not a standard of measure in any way whatsoever other than giving us some approximation of that number, <laughs> that by following that, that we have created a a civilization with a disastrously stunted and primitive sense of time, which is uh, absolutely aberrant and is the cause of the continuing destruction of our biosphere, which is our support system, and that uh, in so doing that we are, we are in a highly precarious situation on this planet, and uh, this uh, situation uh, is theologically referred to as the uh, time of judgment day, that we are being given a test uh, to see if we can respond with intelligence, so it's very difficult to be intelligent when our intelligence has been stunted. So it is we, that's why sometimes we have to uh, become rather impassioned and make our point as strongly as we can. Uh, because it is a very difficult but absolutely simple point that we are attempting to make, and that is that through following an erroneous standard of measure that um, we create a deformed state of mind, and by creating a deformed state of mind, we create a deformed society that is absolutely alienated from the natural cycles. But according to the law of time, whose analysis is that there is an uh, artificial timing frequency and a natural timing frequency that we can define the function, uh, we can define a calendar as an instrument for the harmonization of consciousness with the universal cycles according to the mathematical principles of the synchronic order. The law of time is the presentation of new knowledge it is knowledge that is being brought to light. The law of time is not an invention. It is a discovery, which means that the law of time has always functioned. The law of time governs the whole order of the universe. And according to the law of time, the order of the universe is a synchronic order, that everything is held together in time. When you look at the trees, you don't see, you don't see two trees when you look at one tree. And you don't see two moons when you look at one moon, unless you're drunk, maybe. <laughs> but that's because that moon and you are in the same synchronic order, in the same order in time, happening in time at the same, at the same moment. And this is the meaning of the, of the synchronic order. From the point of view of the law of time, that our civilization is operating uh, with a very primitive time sense, in a time sense that only creates greater and greater uh, intellectual and moral ignorance. And uh, for this reason, it is absolutely uh, destroying ourselves socially as well as destroying our environment. This is the analysis of the law of time. The analysis of the law of time is a fundamentally radically new analysis of the human situation. It is, a, it is an analysis of the human situation that could only have uh, uh, been brought to light at this present moment because we are truly at the end of history. We are truly at the end of time. But this 
cycle of time has been measured by the people who are known as the Maya. And this measure of time is referred to as the long count or the cycle of the 13 Bakhtuns, uh, in which uh, the beginning of history uh, is at this point here. And you have the 13 Bakhtuns. And, and the, the beginning of history is uh, situated at a date 3113 BC. Again, some people say 3114 BC. We don't need to quibble. <laughs> the August 13, 3113 BC on your Gregorian astronomical timeline, uh, which is the date for Ahau 8 Kumhu on the on the Mayan calendar, and that. Uh, this measure of history is a, is a complete cycle of, of 13 Bakhtuns, which each Bakhtun is 394 years. And each, each Bakhtun consists of, of 20 Katuns. Each Katun is slightly less than 20 years. So we are right here at the very, in the 260th Katun, which began early in 1993 and ends at the winter solstice of 2012, less than 13 years away. We're out of time, everybody. <laughs> We're absolutely out of time. The law of time could only be revealed at this moment in time when the pressure of ignorance, when the pressure of violence, when the pressure of the destruction of the, of the environment and the, and the human population bomb was so great that there had to be some illumination to say, what's happening? What are we going to do? Of course, from the point of view of the materialist mindset, nothing's wrong. We've never had it so good. There were never cars, more, more cars produced in history <laughs> than last year. In Moscow, they're crazy about cars. They didn't have cars during the communist era. But now they've got money and they say, buy cars. It's a real, real, real funny thing because those boulevards are eight lanes wide and they never learned how to drive before. So the place is full of fender benders. In one day, all the cars that are driven by one person alone could stretch from here to the moon. 61 million cars were driven just by one person alone back and forth to work in the year 1994. And that's definitely increased since then. We live in a situation of exponentially exaggerated materialism that is spiraling absolutely out of control. And like the guy in the Monty Python and the Vikings movie, <laughs> when they were sailing to New Brasilia, <laughs> and the water is up to here, and they're saying, what's wrong? We never had it so good, blub, 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 and down they go. Well, that's where it's at. We're certainly um, no different than Noah in saying um, something's about to happen. And we're no different than Noah in saying we know what the problem is, and we also have at least some kind of way out that we can refer to, and that way out is to restore our natural time sense and stop living like mechanized rats accelerating faster and faster every year with no vision. Like I said, who has, has, who's presented you with your vision of the year 2100? Where is all this going to take us? How many banks will we have in the Amazon in 2100? How many Starbucks in the Sahara? How many Esso gas stations in the Gobi Desert for the Mongolians? Is that what it's about? No, we won't make it there. We won't make it past 2050. In fact, we won't make it past 2020 at the current rate of exploitation of resources and at the current rate of accelerating uh, ignorance and rapidly lowering to nothing moral ceiling. So this is, this is the analysis of, of the law of time. People say, ah, that's too dire, Arguez. What's wrong with you? Get a credit card and live a little. 
Well, someone has to see it, and someone has to call it, and I'll see it, and I'll call it. And that's what the analysis of the law of time is. It's very interesting. I received do two documents today. I mentioned the one, which is called Time and Morality, establishing a Babylonian source for Hindu and Babylonian chrono Mayan chronologies, which uh, is very interesting because it, this author has a very excellent um, understanding and has done a lot of research. Um, the first year, what he says, the earliest date in history, for instance, was 4236 BC, and it's based on the star Sirius in the beginning of what are called the Sothic cycles. Then he says, the Babylonian chronologies all begin around 3100 BC. And because of that, when he comes across the Mayan, he thinks that because the Mayan great cycle began in 3113, that the Maya borrowed it from the Babylonians. I received another document today. This is a document called, uh, in Spanish, La Razón y el Indio, Reason and the Indian. Most Westerners don't usually put reason and the Indian together. By a man named Fausto Reynaga of Bolivia. He was, all of his books were burned by the Bolivian government. And he has an interest in this book, in this little book, he has some interesting points he makes. He, ha he says, no, it was the Maya who went and taught the Babylonians. It was the Maya who went and taught the Hindus. It was the Maya who went and taught the Chinese. Uh, there is a text um, by Vimalakirti, uh, no, Vikrama, excuse me, uh, and also in the Ramayana uh, that speaks of the uh, Maya, of the Mayas going, uh, coming from across the seas, and that uh, uh, in in their passage across the seas, that that they were the ones who taught the various people of the old world, and that uh, that they, they were they left the earth uh, from the east, uh, and they they taught uh, the people of Burma, and then they instructed the Nagas, who are the serpent people who live under the water, and then to India, and then on to Egypt and Babylonia. Well, that's some interesting points. There's no question of it. And what the, what the other, this is which is opposite of the other writer who speaks of the Babylonians being the source of the Mayan chronology. On the other hand, we know this, that the Mayan, uh, that the, uh, during the classic period of the Maya, that the Mayan inscriptions refer to dates that, that, that are very f ancient in the past, 8,000 years in the past, 300 million years in the past, 400 million years in the past, even as far as 25 billion years in the past. It was the Maya who had the knowledge because they had something that no other people had, and that was the mathematical system to uh, deal with what we call the cycles of time. We're talking about the cyclic order of time with the current definition, the official astronomical time definition uh, is a purely linear definition. As I said, they actually say that beginning January 1st, 4712 BC, as I said, there was no such thing as January 1st then, that is the beginning of the computation of linear historical time. We look at the, this um, indigenous writer, Fausto Rey Naga from Bolivia, when he, he writes about time. He says there are three times, historic time, geological time and cosmic time. So time is, in, in, the, in the indigenous conception of time, time is cosmic. And he says that you cannot separate time from reason. Where there is time, where there is reason and thought, there is time. Where there is thought and reason, there is time. Where there is time, there is thought and reason. And according to the law of time, time is the evolution of consciousness. The definition of time that's officially given separates absolutely any notion of mind and consciousness as having anything to do with time and is purely linear. And he says, further says that the, that the indigenous concept of time is circular. It's round. 
the life is round. The sun, the earth, the moon, the star, all of the galaxy is round. The cosmos is round. The, the uh, indigenous world of the Amata is round. Then he says, nothing is a line. Everything is a circle. The germ, the seed, all of that take a circular form. The, the, concept, the, the linear conception of time is anti-cosmic, anti-natural. It is the I. It is egotism. It is gold. It is the robber and the thief, and it is the assassin. That is linear time. So what, the, what, what we're talking about, and which is ta not taken at all into account in the official definition of time and calendars, is that time is cyclical. All of life is cyclical. Everything moves in cycles. That's why the definition of the calendar that we're giving, the calendar is an instrument for the harmonization of consciousness with the universal cycles according to mathematical principles of the synchronic order. That is, the de what, that is what a, a calendar should be measuring. It should be measuring it with even units of measure, with units of measure that are also correspond to cyclical order. This is the meaning of the 13 moon calendar. When we say, what, what is the Gregorian calendar, besides being an illogical, irrational instrument, okay, we've, we've all seen this, which ruler would you use as a standard of measure? <laughs> One that has e even units of measure of 28 days each, or one that has uneven units of measure. This is the test. That's the test. If you prefer the illogical one, fine. Go to hell. <laughs> if you prefer the, the one that's a harmony, well then good. Let's work for creating heaven on earth. It's as simple as that. That's, that's the test keep telling everybody there is no that's this is very simple test it's an intelligence test it doesn't take too much intelligence to see what is harmonic and what is inharmonic when you see the Gregorian calendar and you see the see that's that one and yes there we go when you see the Gregorian calendar and when you see the 13 moon calendar, this is the test. You have to go to all of your neighbors and say, hey, you may think I'm crazy, but I've got a test for you. Which one do you, you know, I'm, I'm not kidding. You gotta do this. I've gone everywhere. I've talked to all sorts of people. So here's your test. This one here, that's your Gregorian calendar. What you see on there is, the 28 days with all, and then, then showing them the extra days after the day, 28th day of every month. When you add up the extra days after the 28th day of every month, there's your 13th moon, plus your extra day out of time, your 29th day. That's a key, all those are key numbers. Pretty soon we're going to be talking numbers. And this is the 13 moon calendar. 28. 13 moons of 28 days each, absolutely even harmony. That's the test. Is, is this harmonic or is this harmonic? Do you like harmony or do you like disharmony? Of course, we live in a time where we've become so addicted to disharmony that even people can't choose. But it's interesting. When we were in St. Petersburg recently, we were at the Institute of Languages and we were giving this presentation, and the, in, the, in the faculty of the Institute of Languages was a, uh, an indigenous woman from, the, from the, uh, one of the uh, tribes of the north, the Mansi people, and then she stood up and she said, I have to say that what I've heard today is very deep and very profound because I remembered something as I was hearing this presentation, and that was this. Our people also had this calendar. We also had the calendar of the 13 moons and the 28 days. But our people forgot it and no one could remember it. We only heard about it. And now for the first time, I've heard about it again. And now I know that it is 
what is the real time and the real calendar. The 13 moon calendar isn't an invention. It corresponds to the biological cycle. It's not unique to the Maya. This is the 13 moon calendar of the, that's used by the uh, Amira people, the Quechua people of the Andes. The 13 moon calendar is correlated with what we call the summer solstice, June 21st. June 21st is the day out of time on that calendar. It's also the New Year's Day. It has 13 months of 28 days each. It's been around. This is the year 5,507 of this calendar. Each thousand year cycle is called a sun. This is called the Pachacuti. So there, there have been five suns in this calendar. The 13 moon calendar that we're looking at here is just is just a variation of the calendar that you're looking at with the with the Pachacuti calendar. It's interesting. We have to remember now. Planet Earth, everybody. We had Earth Day the other day. Everyone had pretty pink ribbons and parades. But who did something really something for the Earth? who actually considered what are we going to do besides picking up garbage at the side of the road. It's deeper than that. This is the Earth. It spins around the sun. And when we look at it, we see that it has a very interesting quality to it. We see that it has a North Pole and a South Pole and that it has what's called an eastern hemisphere and it has a western hemisphere. The calendar that we were just looking at of the, of the Amira people, that's from the western hemisphere. The Maya civilization, that was in the western hemisphere. What was in the eastern hemisphere? In the eastern hemisphere, we have lunar calendars. Here's the Chinese lunar calendar, totally co-opted by the Gregorian. It says the year 2000, but actually it's the year 4697 on the lunar calendar. This is the Iron Dragon year, and this is the Iron Dragon moon, and this is the 20th day of the Iron Dragon moon. And it's a lunar calendar. The lunar calendar was in, in the old world, okay? What other calendars were in the old world that are still in use today? Lunar calendars. The Hindu, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Korean, the Arab, the Hebrew are all lunar calendars. The, in today, for instance, in the Islamic Arab lunar calendar is the month of Muharram, which is the first month of the year 1421. That year 1421 began on the 5th of April on the Gregorian calendar. And so w the lunar calendars are all the same, though, because there's only one moon. <laughs> it says a, an er what, there's an a Islamic lunar calendar and Chinese lunar calendar. Uh, they're only different in, in the sense that, that they say, well, our calendar began with such and such a date. It's interesting that the Chinese lunar calendar began in the year uh, is now in the year 4697. It began in the long count at 1.1.1.1.1. It began in the uh, in the second, what's called the second uh, Bakhtun and the first Katun of the second Bakhtun, which is also the same as the dedication of the Great Pyramid of Egypt, assuming that uh, uh, it was uh, either built in or, or rededicated at that point. So it corresponds precisely to that point in time. The Maya correlated all of that in the long count. So we could, we had a very, we have a very perfect schematic of, of the history. But what happened was that through, despite the fact that there were early efforts of solar calendars in the old world, that basically what we call the old world developed under lunar calendars. The Gregorian calendar that developed out of the Julian is what we refer to as a pseudo-solar 
calendar. It's it's solar because it, it is a measurement of the what's called the tropical year, the time it takes the Earth to go around the sun. But it's pseudo because it's not a standard of measure and takes no account of any natural cycles. So in 1519, when the Europeans came across the sea to the New World, the New World had the knowledge. The New World had the knowledge of time. The New World had the knowledge of true solar calendars. The New World had the knowledge of, of the function of calendars as being both cyclical and synchronic in function, and that they correlated the cycles of the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, and the galaxy with human existence here for a purpose. And the purpose was to prepare for this moment in time. And it was completely, as, a, as I said this morning, everything that happens has already been recorded. <laughs> It was all preordained. It was a part of the whole big, big script which we will be talking about uh, increasingly as we go through these uh, next few days, the, what we will refer to as the, the psychomythology of Velotropa, <laughs> the experimental zone where we are. This is all happening because we are part of one great experiment which uh, uh, is being overseen by God, which is taking place here in the Velotropa sector of the galaxy. So when, when the Europeans came and discovered the new world, so-called discovery, they were putting to test their doctrine of discovery, the doctrine of discovery which says, if a Christian finds a land possessed by a non-Christian, the Christian has the right to dispossess the non-Christian of that land. That's the doctrine of discovery, Pope Alexander the Seventh, 1452. I'm not lying. This is history. Of course, we're not taught this history. We're taught pretty things like manifest destiny and that we have the high road to civilization. And we forget that not only did we dispossess the people here of their land and their rights, but that we also took people from Africa, for instance, and brought them here and made them slaves. If you go just down the road here on Highway 26 to the other side of the mountain, you get to a little place. It's a beautiful, different place called Warm Springs Indian Reservation. And there's a nice little museum there called the Warm Springs Museum. Warm Springs is the gathering of three tribes, the Wasco tribe, the Warm Springs tribe, and the Northern Paiute. They used to have this whole area as their, uh, as their home base. They didn't have concept of property. They didn't have real estate. They lived naturally. The Wasco lived all along the Columbia, the Northern Paiute, were hunters and gatherers through the area of Nevada and Utah and Idaho and up into this area of Oregon. And the Warm Springs people always lived along the Cascade Mountains. And then, uh, then when they heard from the great white father, Thomas Jefferson, who was both a slaveholder and who ordered the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition to take control of most of the rest of of the American continent here, that uh, uh, he, that Thomas Jefferson also spoke in, ter in terms of the language of the doctrine of discovery, and that uh, we needed to take the land from these people, that they were, they had no sense of the value of land or private property. Remember what I read of Fausto Rey Naga, that linear time is the conception of linear time is anti-cosmic, anti-natural. It is the I, egoism, gold, the robber, and the assassin. And that's embedded in the doctrine of discovery. And so today, you have what's left of these people. There's only of all those tribes, there's 3,000 of them 
scattered across this small Indian reservation. They have a beautiful museum which poignantly tells the story. And in terms of their life as it is told, they wake, they, their tradition was to wake up every day, to give thanks to the Creator, see what the universe would bring that day, go to bed at night and give thanks. Well, some people say, well, that's too simple for me. <laughs> But we're talking about time and morality. As I said, true morality is, is living in harmony with the cycles of nature. When you are absolutely living in harmony with the cycles of nature, you don't need fraudulent institutions like legislatures. You don't need people making laws for you that make your lives more and more complicated. How many laws exist? Why do we have to make more laws every year? It's the function of these people to make more laws every year. It's necessary for them to make these laws. Anytime anyone comes up with a new idea, they have to have laws about it. Anytime anyone has a new invention, they have to make more laws about it. Well, the law of time is to abolish all laws. It is the one divine supreme law that governs the universe. It has always existed and always will exist. Humans will either get with the program or they won't get with the program. And the purpose of my mission and my message is to say there's a way we can get with the program right now and that's to get in tune with the cycles of time through the cyclic order as it's manifest through the 13 moon calendar of 28 days. It's it's a message that we uh, and a uh, uh, a message that we keep coming back to, and we keep coming back to it. And everything that the, that we talk about the law of time is based on this very very simple uh, uh, point of re of going to this calendar, which means, of course, in your own personal life, that you have to start living this calendar and reject the Gregorian calendar. That you have to actually say, okay, I'm actually going to follow this. Today really is the 22nd day of the planetary moon. It's not really April 25th. These are both illusions ultimately. But to when you have a headache, <laughs> you got to do something about it. You have to have a better medicine. So all we're saying is we are we are we have a disease. We have a moral disease, we have a spiritual disease, we have a mental disease, and that is a disease of twelve sixty time. We have been deformed. We have to admit that many of our impulses, many of our instincts, many of our thoughts, even the best meaning of us are actually 1260 thoughts, 1260 conditioned thoughts. There really isn't such a thing as money and there isn't really any such thing as private property. These are all illusions. We have to get back to the natural way. There isn't much time. We're here and we're talking about the completion of that cycle in 20. 12. The, pacha, the 13 moon calendar is the, is the natural biological cycle of the human species. It's the natural biological cycle of the human female. Everything is born of woman. Therefore, it's the natural biological cycle of the human species. Every man has to cop to this that no, we come from woman. And it's the woman's cycle that is the measure of our life. And that if we're going to restore order into our life and we are going to save ourselves and our planet, that this is one simple step that we need to take. It's not salvation. It's just an intelligence test. But it is at a point in time where 
passing this intelligence test could lead to the salvation of your planet. And that's very much to the point. The 13 moon calendar that takes the form that we're showing you here, where is that bigger wave spell? Give me a big wave spell. Oh well, here. We had one here. We have tons of things here. We're this is very professorial. I'm just a nutty professor with lots of things, okay? Here, this calendar, this 13, and this form here, we'll just talk about it in this form right here, okay? Because this form is just, all you see is 13 moons, 28 days, 28 days, 28 days, 13 times. 13 times 28 is 364, and the there's the 365th day, which is the day out of time. 364 is, fi is 52 times 7. It's 13 times 28. Let's see, I got one that shows it like that. Yeah, there you go. All sorts. This is what we call about harmonic mathematical principles. This is, remember, we're, we're back in school, okay, kids? that this is, we're talking about uh, mathematical harmonic order. According to the prophecy of the Telectonon, that the 13 moon calendar that we are talking about is one that is synchronized to the date, the Gregorian date of July 26th. But because of that, that doesn't mean, it doesn't invalidate the Pachacuti calendar that we showed you. It synchronizes all calendars because if it's harmonic, It'll harmonize everything. It'll harmonize all the lunar calendars that were used in the old world. And it will harmonize the solar calendar. In fact, the 13 moon calendar is a solar lunar calendar. It's a measure of the ve what's called vague solar year of 365 days. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the scientists, they all get hung up about that. But hey, what about those extra six hours? What about that extra quarter a day? What are you going to do? Well, you know, it's very interesting. Um, you have to balance something. You know, uh, there's the Sothic cycle that I mentioned, which is a 1,460-year cycle, 1,460-year cycle. That's 73 times 20. That cycle is if you start with just a 365-day calendar and don't have leap year day, in 1,460 years, it always corrects itself. Who cares? The scientists are the only ones that care <laughs> about those little extra numbers up there. And that's a, that, the, to be addicted to those little numbers there at the price of harmony is a, is a great fundamental problem and a great fundamental error. This. 13 moon calendar is in our biology. That's why I said the, the, the female cycle of 28 days. And as the, as the, um, as the, where was that Pachacuti calendar again? The nice pretty one? Yeah, right there. Here. Not only is it the female cycle of 28 days, but uh, as this makes very clear, this calendar is based on the fact that the moon goes around the earth 13 times a year. That's true. The, the measurement of the lunar calendar, 29 and a half days, is an earth-based measurement of the synodic cycle when you see from new moon to new moon, okay? But that's what we see on earth. This, the sidereal cycle of the moon is 27 days. So between that 27-day cycle, that's when the moon appears at one place in the sky to when it appears in the same place in the sky again. That's different from new moon. So between the 27 days and the 29 days, if you're actually up there orbiting out in time space, you'll see that moon goes around the Earth 13 times while the Earth goes around the sun once. The indigenous people knew that. All, in fact, virtually all indigenous people knew that, and the interesting thing was that they knew it correlated to the female menstrual cycle. And so that's the natural, that's the natural time. That's the measurement of the natural time. This 
calendar, which which the the we have the the South American, the Pachacuti. We also have what the Maya used. The Maya were sophisticated. I mean, they were really sophisticated. The classic Maya. They had at least 17 calendars. That's because they knew that time isn't a line. And they knew that time had something to do with the evolution of consciousness. And they knew that time had something to do with morality. So they were, they were sophisticated. And among the calendars that they had was their version of the 13 moon calendar, which is called the Tun Uk, which is the uh, which means the moon count or the count of seven. But the, these calendars, which are solar and lunar calendars, okay, they're, they're the, what we need, you know, for balancing the world. You know, the world is like this. Hey, are we awake? You got a brain? This is a brain. You see that? That's a brain. It's got two halves, two hemispheres, just like your planet. Eastern Hemisphere and Western Hemisphere, right Hemisphere and Left Hemisphere. When the European conquest occurred, it was like the Left Hemisphere came over to the right and said, got them. But they didn't realize that was their own right hemisphere. And we're all suffering for it today. This is your brain. <laughs> this is your brain on bad time. <laughs> Pachacuti, the Tunuk, the Druid calendar also. This is the, the month of the willow, Saele, in the, in the Druid calendar. The Druid calendar is still used by the Druids in England today. It's cor it has its day out of time on the, uh, what's correlated to the 23rd day of December. New Year's Day is the 24th, interestingly enough. And those 13 perfect moons of 28 days and it's also interesting that they divide the calendar also into uh, five cycles of 72 days each, plus a five-day period. And uh, of course, you can uh, divide uh, that 72 plus the f uh, five cycles of 72 days plus a five-day cycle. 72 times five is 360, plus five is 365. Those are five big uh, pentad cycles. The y you also have at the same time, you have 73 cycles of five days. Okay? Or in the, in the solar calendar of the Maya, the Hab, which uh, you have uh, 18 20 day cycles. Each of those 20 day cycles is divided into five day cycles. So that's 72 cycles plus of five days plus the five day cycle. So you have either five cycles of 72 days plus five days, or 72 cycles of five days, plus the five days. Okay. So those are some interesting things that are in common between the Druid calendar, for instance, and the, and the Tunuk, the Hab, and the Mayan, uh, the Mayan Hab and Tunuk uh, calendars. The um, Druid uh, calendar is also interesting because, uh, as I said, it's another example of, of a 13 moon calendar. I'm just mentioning this because this is uh, universal. I mentioned the Mansi people in the north. We have also the Hawaiians, the Polynesians, the South Americans, the Mayans, the Druids. Yeah. The Druids had the 13 moon calendar and they also had a tree language of 20 letters. So they had 1320. They said the law of time is based on a frequency of 1320. The Sanskrit alphabet the original Sanskrit alphabet had 20 consonants and 13 vowel sounds. And just like the Druid with the tree alphabet of 20 letters and then the 13 moons, which are all related to trees as well. The, this is just showing that the frequency, the timing frequency of 1320 is embedded in our biology. What the law of time shows is that Time is actually a form of information biology. Time informs life. Life doesn't inform time. You can't tell time anything. Tell, time's going to tell you everything. Time informs life. Time 
is so time is something that's higher than and greater than life. I said the the I quoted the Tartang Tulku this morning, so we don't know much about time because time has been hidden from us. But now the law of time time is no longer hidden from us. Now we know. We know that time is information biology. We know that time informs life. We know that time is a frequency and it's a mathematical constant, uh, a ratio of 13 to 20. We showed you the 13, 4 is to 7, as 7 is to 13. Time to stretch. I can stretch. You can stretch too. Huh? Don't fall asleep on me. Okay? Here, we got this great ratio. I'll do it in red here. 4 is to 7, and 7 is to 13. Okay? You can read over my overlay there. Okay? Now, that's interesting because 4 times 7 is 28. 7 times 13 is 91. And if you add the numbers 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to plus 7, that equals 28. And if you add the numbers 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to plus 13, that equals 91. This is, the math this is what we call the mathematical principles of the synchronic order. Okay? I'll go over that again. We're gonna. We're in the process of learning a new language. Uh -huh. It's the language of number. Uh -huh. This is the ma the language of number that was defined by the by what is called the vigesimal twenty count mathematics of the Maya. The Maya counted from one through nineteen, had the positional zero, so they had great ability to make astronomical numbers. Okay, based on the 20 count. All of this is based on the 20 count. The, sci the true science of time is based on the 20 count, and it consists of a few very simple ratios. Okay. We said that ratio of time, 13, 20, the difference between the 13 and the 20 is the 7. The 7 is the key number that's implicit in the in the mathematical constant 1320 to 7 13 plus 7 equals 20 and 7 as we showed this morning is the middle point between 1 and 13 and the basis of the 7 is established by the 4 because the 4 is the is the midpoint between 1 and 7 1 2 3 1 2 3 Four in the center. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven in the center. Four is to seven as seven is to thirteen. That's the key ratio. And you see the numbers we're dealing with. Four, the four and the seven give you multiplied give you the twenty-eight, which is the number of the thirteen moon twenty-eight day cycle, the human biological cycle. Incidentally, also the cycle that the dolphins keep. The dolphins mark time. The dolphins mark time. This is a study that was recently done. So the, mar the dolphins mark time every day in their teeth. They leave a little line. Every 28 days, they have a thick line. Every 13 times like that, they start another row. Okay. Dolphins are on the following natural time. They've been trying to tell us something. They're on natural time. Okay. That's the time we're supposed to be on. That's the time that, was, that God gave the woman okay, to count as her measure, which is the measure of man. And so this is the 28. 4 is to 7. 4 times 7 gives you the 28. Se 7 is to 13 which gives you the 91, okay? 91 is 1 plus 2, et cetera, up to plus 13 equals 91. So all of your, all of your numbers are right there. This is just a, 
a basic code. And that's why we say that the 13 moon 28 day calendar satisfies the definition of a calendar b uh, as defined by the law of time, that it is an instrument for the harmonization of human mind and consciousness with the cycle, with the universal cycles, the, with the universal cycles according to the mathematical principles of the synchronic order. There's nothing in the Gregorian calendar that you can do that, that is like this. It misses this point altogether. That's why we all have to be in a basic point of education, that we, are, we need to educate ourselves about this. This is new knowledge. It will lift up your mind. It will give you, it will give up, it will give your mind and your spirit nutrition and food you can begin to move into another realm but you have to you have to become like a child again that's why we talk about galactic kindergarten <laughs> that we really really are at that level galactic kindergarten is where we have to start this whole process what was the point that we missed in time when we when we conquered when we conquered when the europeans came and conquered all the people on this continent and on this part of the world. And they destroyed them and they destroyed their knowledge. And they confused as much of that knowledge as they could. And instead of the richness of the, what you might call the polyphonic symphony of Mayan time, they were given the linear time, the straight line time of the Gregorian calendar. And that has come to be the all pervasive standard of time that dominates the world today, even that Chinese calendar has, uh, as I say, has on it the year 2000 and not the year 4697, which is the actual. See, everyone, everyone's uh, cops to this arbitrary year 2000 that we're talking about here. See, that's just that's just a fiction. It's all a fiction, but sometimes. Um, there are very, very damaging fictions. And uh, the damaging fiction of time is what we are here to uh, attempt to uh, correct with the knowledge of the law of time. The only reason knowledge comes, why would there be new knowledge? Because something isn't working right. Something we're deficient someplace. So the whole point of this is that we are we have a very deficient understanding of time and we must go back to understand what time is and that we're just at the very simple basic order of of cyclical time that everything goes in cycles everything is in a round the universe is a spiral every that spiral is based on a circle there isn't any linear time the scientists quantum physicists and all of them, they talk about the arrow of time as if there was, as if time was an arrow. And then, then they think they're getting really clever when they talk about, uh, does the arrow of time go forwards and backwards? Uh, and it doesn't mean anything. Those are just uh, abstract arguments and logics that have no basis. There's absolutely no basis uh, yeah, whatsoever for even thinking in that kind of way. So, so the 13 moon calendar is based on a synchronic mathematical ordering principle. And very simple. And I said we'll keep coming back to this again and again. Four is to seven, as seven is to 13. Okay? And that uh, it's very interesting that in the in the Holy Quran that. Uh, when you get to Surah 91, that Surah 91 is called the sun. <laughs> because that's, that's related to that number right there. And the first seven verses of that Surah are, are all refer to different levels of the, of the earth, the day, the night, the sun, the moon, uh, heaven, earth. And the seventh point, the seventh point, because it's all about the seven. And the seventh point is the perfection of the human soul. That's the... That's why we're on Earth. It says, it says that after the great feud in heaven, after, after Satan 
duped Adam and Eve that God said, go down to earth for a while and see if you can pass the test. Go down to earth for a while. And that is where the test occurs. So it is, it is here on earth that we are being given this test, okay, which is ultimately is the test of time. Surah 103 of the Quran, which is called um, time or the late afternoon. <laughs> it says, by the time or by the late afternoon, surely man is at a loss. The late afternoon, what is that? That's the end of the 13th Baktun. That's the late afternoon. And in the late afternoon, the humanity is surely at a loss because humanity does not know about time and does not know what time it is. We have to know what time it is. It's not that time, what time it is, is it means that we have to develop an intelligent, mental, moral, spiritual comprehension of exactly where we are, why we are where we are, and how we get out of where we are. We're all, as I said, in prison. We're in the 1260 prison. Absolute truth. We've been saying this. We've been saying that when you, when in this, in this prison, in this house, this house is on fire. And then when the house is on fire, you know, someone says, hey, or you're in the theater. Hey, you're all in the theater. You're all looking up here someplace. <laughs> someone says, fire. You know, exit. When I look at the exit, it says 13 moon calendar. <laughs> That's an exit from the false time. And the false time is the final deception. It's the greatest deception that was ever perpetrated. And I know how great it is because I have gone to the Vatican and I have talked and I have seen those people and I have seen how hard they slam their doors when we bring up this topic. This isn't the first time the topic was presented to them. Some of you might have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. What was that about? A lot of, in around 1950 or 51, a lot of scrolls were found around the Dead Sea in, in 11 caves around the Dead Sea. In caves 4 and 11, between 4 and 11 is 7. In those caves were all sorts of documents pertaining to time. What was, what, what was the Dead Sea Scrolls? The Dead Sea Scrolls were left by a sect, probably the Essenes, uh, who uh, around 180 years before Christ were led by someone who was known simply as the teacher of righteousness. And they describe that the teacher of righteousness had a struggle with the wicked one, the evil priest, <laughs> It's all archetypal stuff. And the sect broke away from the Orthodox Jews. Why? They broke away from the Orthodox Jews over the issue of calendar. The Essenes were following a calendar of 364 days. Most of the scholars are loath to say it was 13 moons. <laughs> but some of them do admit that it was a calendar of 13 moons, of 28 days, especially the, the female scholars. <laughs> so it's very interesting that, that this breakaway sect, the Essenes who left the Dead Sea Scrolls, that the reason they became a breakaway sect was because of the issue of calendar. They said the Hebrews were following a purely lunar calendar, which they've been doing, and that the problem with the lunar calendar is you can't fix the dates of the holidays, changes, 
every year. And it's not a solar calendar. A lunar calendar is not a solar calendar. The lunar calendar me is, measures a cycle of 12 synodic lunations, which add up to 354 days. That's not a solar year. It's 11 days short of a solar year. And in that calendar, the, the festivals keep changing. The, the, the time when they occur in relationship to the sun. And so the Essenes said, no, the, the teacher of righteousness has revealed that the 13 moon calendar, that the cycle of 364 days, this calendar, we can fix our festivals so they have, we know exactly when they're going to happen. On the 13 moon calendar that we have been presenting to the world, for instance, Christmas is always Friday the 13th of the rhythmic moon. You know, and the, the way the Christian, the way the Vatican uses the calendar, you don't know when Easter is going to be. This year Easter was on the 23rd of April. Last year e Easter was on April 4th. And this was the big argument that the Essenes had with the Orthodox Jews. They said, no. If we follow this calendar of perfect harmony, then we'll know when the, when, when the festival days are and we can live a righteous life. And they were right. That's something you don't know about either. So this 13 moon calendar has been, has been around and it is, as I said, a true solar lunar calendar. If this had been, if this had not been a planet in the experimental zone, <laughs> if this had happened in another galaxy, where life was maybe evolving properly. The people who came across the ocean and discovered another land might have said, wow, look what, what do you have that we don't have? And they would have said, hey, look what we got. We got calendars, we got computation system you wouldn't believe. And the people who had come to that other land would have said, wow, that's really something. Let's get together. Let's do something. Let's make, let's, let's unify ourselves in time. No, that didn't happen. We were living in a world where the old world had been dominated by lunar calendars, which had been actually uh, the, the device used basically by the male priest class, because all the societies are patriarchal, 201, and that ironically using the, mo the lunar calendar to maintain male supremacy. <laughs> Priests are men in robes. <laughs> and not operating with a solar calendar. That's just a pure lunar calendar. The lunar, that's, that's one side. What about the solar side? We never as a species developed a true, our true solar nature. When we were supposed to have a solar calendar, we got the pseudo-solar calendar, the Gregorian, with the fiction of the straight line, which is, has nothing to do with time. Time is not going a line. It, it is in cycles and in circles. So as a result of that, the human species has, has been deprived of arriving at a true, fully functioning solar lunar consciousness. It's interesting, for instance, most of the lunar calendars, because of a lunar year, which is based on the synodic cycle, is 355 days, 11 days short of a solar year. That means every three years or so, there's an extra month that they add. In 19 years, every 19 years, they, they add seven months. That's an important number. The, the sect that left the Dead Sea Scrolls had this worked out really well. Everything was measured in 14ths. It was four, 14 days to the full moon, 14 days till you see the, until there's no moon. So, and so they said the full moon equals the, in brightness one seventh of the sun. So that's an interesting point to get back to our sevens. That the, that the full moon is one seventh the brightness of the sun. And so they were very much based in what we call the synchronic order. They were unconsciously following the law of time. They saw that the purpose of a calendar had, 
had uh, something to do with harmony, and it also had to do with creating a higher state of mind. Okay. So we have two very, very radically different views here of time and of calendars. Okay. We have the view of the 1260 Gregorian uh, concept that the a calendar is merely to 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 create the measure of the of the tropical year with no reference to si any other cycles and with no reference to the human mind or consciousness. And we have the development through most of the prehistory, through most of the indigenous peoples of the world, and even down through history, as we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and with the Druids, and continuing in South America with the Pachacuti calendar, of a concept of time that we are a part of the cosmos. We are cosmic beings. That we are here on earth for a purpose, and the purpose is the perfection of the human soul. That's why we're given this, this planet. We were given this planet to see if we could perfect our soul on this planet. And because we went further and deeper into deception, we are not only not perfecting our soul, we are destroying the planet. And that's because we have become a rebellious species operating on, our, on what we think is our concept of time, our, our artificial time. And it is that artificial time that is creating the accelerating machine world that is rapidly destroying everything. And that's the simple point. That's why we say this is the judgment day test. That's the analysis of the law of time. It's not an analysis you'll read in the New York Times or the Washington Post or Figaro <laughs> or the Frankfurter Allgemeine. Because this is an analysis that's coming from deep within the human soul and psyche from deep within the collective mind of the human species. This analysis has had to emerge, has had to emerge precisely at this time because as it says in Sir 130, 103, excuse me, by the time surely man is at a loss because we have forgotten the knowledge of time we have become deviant concerning the knowledge of time. This is a new analysis. This is a new knowledge. But it is brought forth by the discovery of the law of time. A discovery is bringing to light knowledge that has been previously unknown. But because it was unknown doesn't mean it hasn't existed. This is not an invention. This is the analysis of the law of time. And the law of time governs everything. Absolutely everything. There is not anything that escapes the law of time. Some people go out and say, wow, I like to have my pleasure. And then, you know, it's over. It's just, a, just as simple as that. Cheap thrills. That's because time is incessant. What are you here for? How do we wake up? How do we make something decent about the life on this earth? That's what the law of time is about. That is why it is also referred to as a revelation. Revelation does not contradict reason or logic. Revelation is nothing but reason and logic. It is, the, it is putting reason and logic into a place where there has been unreason and illogic. And that's why it is a revelation. We weren't the first people to think of this calendar reform. As early as 1842, uh, the French philosopher Auguste Comte 
And that was exactly 260 years after the Gregorian calendar reform in, in 1842, from 1582 to 1542. August Comte was shown uh, information about a 13-moon calendar that the Polynesians of Tahiti used. And he studied that, and after seven years, in 1849, uh, he came to the conclusion that it should replace the Gregorian calendar. He said, we need a 13-moon calendar. It's got 28 days. It's logical. Of course, he was the founder of logical positivism. And in 1849, he proposed that calendar. Towards the end of the last century, there had been a number of movements to reform the calendar. In 1908, in Santiago, Chile, at the, at the meeting of the Pan-American Union of Scientists, the calendar that we showed you, the Pachacuti calendar, was presented by a, a Peruvian scientist who said, this is correct. This will, this will correct the time. In 1921, an Englishman by the name of Cotsworth presented 13 moon calendar to the International Chamber of Commerce and the International Chamber of Commerce said, hey, that's great. We can keep straight records. We can't do our accounting straight on that Gregorian calendar. The days of the month are always changing. They say, hey, no interest to pay for 180 days or six months, but hey, six months is slightly more than 180 days. And when you come there, after six months, they say, no, sorry, it's uh, 183 days have gone by. You owe us so much interest. All those interest rates, usury, are built into the Gregorian calendar. That's why all those little, all those little extra days are like those little one and a half percent, one and three eighths percent, whatever you want. Interest, usury, making money on money. Of course, the civilization is now based on that concept. It's what they call a money economy. Time is money. So the International Chamber of Commerce in 1921 said, sounds good, we can keep straight records, our accounting will be okay. And they were honest businessmen, I guess, huh? There is such a thing. And so they also attracted the attention of, of a, an American industrialist, George Eastman, who was the founder of Kodak. We all know Kodak. Kodak's synonymous with photography almost, right? Cameras. George Eastman said, that's great. Let's go for it. So George Eastman and the International Chamber of Commerce went to the League of Nations, the forerunner of the United Nations, and in 1930, the League of Nations voted to replace the Gregorian calendar with the 13 moon calendar of 28 days. They said, effective January 1st, 1933, we will have a new calendar. It will be the 13 moon, 28 day calendar. What happened between between 1930 and 1933, a um, little history. The Vatican had supreme power in the 16th and 17th centuries. But following the Protestant Revolution and the, uh, ironically the rise of industrial civilization in the Protestant countries, and, the, and then following that, the democratic revolutions, that the Vatican lost its land-based power and, and its political power. In the 1860s and 70s was the Italian revolution, social revolution, the democratic revolution. And uh, the popes retreated in, into self-exile in the Vatican. And they lost all their political power. So between 1900 and 1928, they had very, very tenuous status in the modern world. And then finally, in 1928, Benito Mussolini recognized the Vatican as a political state, as an entity, the little four acres, 
was given all the status of a nation state, its own post office, its own police, and most important, its own banking system. The banking system of the Vatican operates absolute in absolute secrecy. It's the it's the clearinghouse for money from many different places on this planet. So that was in 1928. So the, at that point in time, the Vatican got its power back. And in 1930, when it came to their attention that the League of Nations was going to change the calendar and give the world a 13-moon, 28-day calendar, the Vatican mounted a huge propaganda campaign. And by 1933, the campaign was successful. What was the basis of the Vatican's propaganda campaign? The day out of time. They said, which then in, that, in the League of Nations proposal, that was called Null Day, no day of the week at all, as we know. And the Vatican said, along with they, they got many conservative astronomers from Portugal and Spain and Italy to back them up, they said that if, they, if, the, if the League of Nations adopted as the new civil standard for humanity this calendar that has a day out of time, that that day out of time would break this, the weekly succession set in motion by God. In other words, if there was a gap between one Saturday and the next Sunday, that that would break the weekly succession established by God at the beginning of time. This was the Vatican's argument. It was very, and, and it was con carried by many conservative astronomers and, of course, many other factors behind the scenes, not the least of which was the banking factor. The Vatican won that point. They had, you, we, we, you can see political cartoons from that era. <laughs> okay, pro-Vatican political cartoons, which which uh, my favorite one shows uh, uh, a car going across a bridge, and the people and the bridge says 13 moons or 13 months, 28 day calendar, and the people in the car are saying, "Wow, what a great bridge! What perfect harmony!" And then there's a the bridge. There's a break at one point in the bridge, which of course the drivers can't see where the car is going to go off the bridge, and that's the day out of time. The Vatican said, if, if we have a day out of time, humanity will be plunged into war, violence, barbarism, and chaos. Where are we today? So we never found out what it would be like to have that day out of time. Humanity has suffered from that error as many other errors, but that's compounded ignorance. As I said, that the time, the measure of time is a measure of human intelligence. The understanding and comprehension of time has to do with human morality. In 1961, the Vatican II Council concluded with one final little statement. At that council, at that Vatican II Council, to, among other things, the Vatican said, the only hope for the survival of the Vatican in the 21st century is a strong pope. Pushed by the office of propaganda. Do you know where the word propaganda came from? In the early 17th century, to counter the Protestants, the Vatican opened up an office called the uh, Office of Propaganda f of the Faith, Propagating the Faith, Propaganda. Day, okay, the propagating the f that's where the word propaganda comes from. Okay, this is the office of propagating the faith. So that only through the a strong pope uh, supported by the office of propaganda <laughs> will the Vatican survive into the 21st century. You have a very strong pope right now. He might be a good guy. He might be a ga bad guy. It's up to God. But he's a very strong pope. Because he's, why? Because the Office of Propaganda makes sure his pictures in the paper every day. You don't, if you live in Latin America, <laughs> hardly a day goes by when you won't see his picture in the paper. 
Kepta. That's called propaganda. So at that 1961 Vatican II Council, they concluded and said, well, the Vatican is not opposed to calendar reform if, if it respects the seven days of the week. It's a very, very awkwardly worded little statement. So we took that statement, we put that back to the Vatican. Of course, that's why I said they slammed their doors on us. They didn't want us to know that they had made that statement. That, uh, and they don't want to have the dialogue about it either. But, but they, and nor do they want to hear about the day out of time, which was they used as the basis of opposing the 13 moon calendar in the first place. Well, 70 odd years have gone by now since, since the League of Nations voted for that. The United Nations itself adjourned debate on calendar reform inconclusively in 1956, never taking up the issue again. And of course, since then, the philosophy of time is money has prevailed and has conquered the world. And since then, the 1260, uh, process has become so phenomenal. In 1960, so in the 40 years from 1960 to, to, to 2000, 40 years, the human population doubled from 3 billion to 6 billion. That is a staggering exponential fact. That doubling of the population. The, human population had never doubled before until the Industrial Revolution, which is a function of the 1260 timing frequency. And at the time of the Industrial Revolution, in the year 1750, there were 500 million human beings, and 90 years later, there were a billion. But it took another, another 90 years before there were another billion, two billion. Then from 1930 to 1960, one more billion, but then the doubling in 40 years from 3 billion to 6 billion. You have an exponential curve that is paced by, uh, by a machine technology and further paced by uh, cybernetic high tech, which is further paced by stock markets. So the whole analysis of the law of time, that time is money, the time is money dominates, the time is money is the ruling order of the day, is absolutely, absolutely um, proven. When we came back from our trip to Russia and Germany, as I said, Russia loves this uh, Mayan factor idea of path beyond technology because they don't want the money. We came back and we said, please, God, give us a sign that maybe something's happening in this country. And it's very interesting to see the looks on these people's faces. That's money. That's not their, you know, no one pinched them or hurt them. No one stepped on their toes. That's just money that's causing them to look in anguish. Well, the stock markets will flip-flop because Bill Gates has his billions to move around to keep it from sagging too much. But it won't last long. That's the point. So we are at this point now where we have put forth the calendar change peace plan. And when the time of prophecy began, the seven years of prophecy in uh, 1993. Within a year, it was clear to us that we had to present a peace plan, that if we wanted to have peace on the planet, one way we could have peace on the planet would be by stopping the world. <laughs> Don Juan says, stop the world. Yeah. Other people say, oh, you're just Luddites. <laughs> You want to set the clock back. That's, you know, they like that expression, set the clock back. Well, we don't even believe in the clock, so there's no clock to set back. <laughs> it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with restoring order and sanity and morality to the human race. And we have to have some simple place to begin, one simple little step 
to begin. And so that's the basis of the calendar 13 moon calendar change peace movement. Very clear. And we've been saying that every year. Day out of time. The importance of the day out of time. It's a supremely important moment. And it's important to recognize that it is the day out of time. That it isn't any day of the week at all. That it is the time to celebrate no time and fourth dimensional time and human life and forgiveness of debt and pardoning of sins. We've said every year, and we put forth every year, this plan in different forms. And this form here was the first form, the bio, which includes the Pax Cultura, Pax Biosferica, that we need to have peace for the biosphere. If we take, if we can get the people of the earth to observe the day out of time to change the calendar, that then we can take that opportunity to begin to reorder our priorities. That's the whole point. That's the beginning of peace. If you stop everything for one day, hey, stop your machines for one day. Don't drive your cars. Don't go to the supermarket. Put away your credit cards. Don't spend money. Walk. Grow a garden. Then peace will begin. The machine will stop. The natural forces, the inevitable karmic forces will stop us in an ugly way. Or we can have the moral courage to say, let's try to stop this ourselves. People say, what happened to the Maya? Where did they go? They had such a beautiful civilization and then they just cut out. There, that was just a lesson. You can be at the peak of something and say, hmm, let's stop and see what happens. Basis of the 13 moon calendar change peace plan always is to observe the day out of time as that possible day to go everywhere and say, hey, did you know we just declared peace? We're not going to wait for the governments to declare peace. In 1996, at Teotihuacan in Mexico on, on July 26th, we had, the, we had the first world peace. We went there, we had a march through, the, through Teotihuacan that day in the pyramids and came to the end and said, hey, this is the beginning of the first world peace. The rest of the world may not know about this, but we've declared peace. We're at peace. We're following a new calendar and a new time. The governments may not like this, and they may not follow it, but we're following it, and there's a lot more people who are following it. I got some newspaper articles here, right here. Yeah, this one. Yeah, here we go, right here. For instance, from La Paz, Bolivia, where some of our earth wizards marched up from Chile up to Bolivia after, our, after the seven weeks in Peak Arquin. It's hard to see here, but it says here, the calendar of 13 moons of 28 days will replace the Gregorian cal calendar under the banner of peace. We get these people, Andres Urea, who was one of the earth wizards who was marching there is going to the people saying, hey, there's a new time and a new calendar. This is the kind of, of uh, movement that we need to see. The people take it upon themselves to go talk and teach other people. Don't just sit around and wait. Well, what's Jose going to tell us to do today? The hell with Jose. What are you going to do today? That's the point. That's what makes this a peace movement. That other people take up the banner, the banner of peace, which was also discredited by the United Nations and UNESCO, and march with that. Say, hey, have you heard there's a new time? People say, oh, there's a new millennium. There ain't no new millennium. <laughs> Look outside. 
It's still the 20th century. You're not going to have a new millennium until you have a new time, and you're not going to have a new time until you have a new calendar. It's just as simple as that. These are strong words. You know, I'm not afraid. I've been saying this for seven years, and like I said this morning, now we're in the belly of the beast. We're in the big P1, power one, Pentagon one, G7, superpower. The Super Bowl was won. We clobber anyone we want. It's hard to get an audience in this country to hear this message. People are busy. They have too many workshops to go to. They're trying to get higher consciousness and higher Merkaba to get them to the ascension. We're not talking about that stuff. Like I said, this isn't escapism. This is, are you ready to take responsibility? Can you go talk to your neighbor like I'm talking to you? Can you take this message to other people? That's the meaning of a movement. This isn't, as he said many times, this isn't a private club, this isn't a tea party. You may think it's clever and you can decode all you want, <laughs> but that's not what it's about either. It's about getting into the new time and realizing, really realizing, what a revolution is. We were in Troitsk, Russia, with a group, maybe an audience this size. And afterwards, we were with this audience, and, and there was a lot of enthusiasm. And, and I said, listen, I'll tell you something Vladimir Lenin said, which you know about, too. Vladimir Lenin said, give me a handful of people, and I will change the world. I've been saying that for seven years, and I've got a peace movement in Japan. I've got a peace movement now in Russia. I've got a peace movement down in Latin America. It's not mine. I've just been a catalyst. And I'm not going to be around long. I'm not going to be around to hold anyone's hand, that's for sure. Like I said, this is serious. This is serious business to me. I'm not going to sit around and talk just nice words to make you feel better. I'm not interested in making you feel better. I am interested in knowing if you're alive, and I am interested in knowing if you're awake, and I am interested in knowing if you can hear this message and realize that there might be something to it that there's more to a calendar than just your appointment book. That there is something new to be learned. That time is not a line. And that history is almost over. It is over. It ended. It ended with a lot of lies. And now there's just a lot of blustering going on. And everyone's hedging their bets, sitting on the sidelines, waiting to see. Waiting, waiting, waiting. It says in the Quran, they're all waiting, we're waiting too. And in the end, you'll know who had greater knowledge and who had greater power. I knew that when we were going to do this event, that after going everywhere around the planet, most everywhere, there's places I didn't get to, which I hope to get to, like New Zealand. But I got to a lot of other places with this message personally, because it was my obligation to do this. And I said, well, okay, now we're really going to do it. We have to come here and we have to give it here in North America, in the so-called United States.
I thought a lot about my life. I used to think that maybe I was someone from someplace, but now I know I'm no one from nowhere. And that makes it a lot easier for me, being no one from nowhere. Because this is just knowledge. It isn't something I made up. I already gave my soul to the Creator. So it's not hard, even though it's emotional. We're going to be together for another six days, and I want to share knowledge, because I'm not going to do this again. We said, first and last time in North America. So, I see we got a few people, but hey, for what North America is, I know, they're off in other seminars, they're off in other workshops. They have to, they're responsible for their business cards and the names on them and what it says. But I'm not going to do this again. So I just want to share some knowledge over the next six days. And what I share, I hope that you will be able to have an open mind and expand your heart and really accept that and do something with it. Share it with somebody else. And don't count on me to tell you about it again. There's a lot of information. The law of time has produced a revolution of knowledge through my blood and, my blood and flesh. You've got your dream spell. You've got your telectinon. You've got your 20 tablets. You can go read the Arcturus probe. You can study the Mayan factor again. You can even read surfers. And we're going to give you 7777. Those are all tools and instruments of revolution, the revolution of time. If you take those, study them, and do something with them, and share it. This is a biological process. We are evolving. The law of time is a manifestation of the need for the human species to change its direction and evolve mentally, morally, and spiritually and get out of the dead-end trap of materialism. So there's plenty for you to study and work with and play with. So you really don't need me after this. I'll give it to you straight and I'll share what I know. But then it's up to you. Can we empty our cup? Can we empty our vessel so we can hear knowledge? Can we accept that we're all here at this moment? That we've all come together precisely because we're supposed to be here? And then can we listen again? I started the day with the verse about Lord Buddha who said the earth is my witness. We don't need anyone outside of ourselves to confirm our reality. We need to wake up. We need to wake up to the fact that there was a point in time when our mother and father experienced a moment of heat and we came into this physical plane, this earth plane, 
We were incubated in our mother's wombs in a cycle of time, a cycle of time connected to that 260-day cycle, approximately that cycle plus a wave spell. We were incubated in the womb, and then we came into this world. And in this present form, we are each incarnate flesh. We have blood. We have a mind. We were given intelligence. We were given a gift of self-reflection. But we betray God when we act stupid. We betray our birthright when we act stupid and ignore what we hear and ignore each other. And when we're hard on each other, we really ignore the message of love that was given then by Christ. And after Christ came Muhammad with a book, a book of clear arguments and clear signs of how we as an errant species of human being could have gotten so far off track that we no longer know where we're going, why we are here, or what we are doing. So we are at a critical point in time. And precisely in time, the knowledge of time is given. The law of time makes conscious what was previously unconscious. And what we are to die to is the cycle that has brought us to this place, the 1260 timing frequency, the error in time. We can identify it. And then we have to look deeper inside because it isn't just a superficial thought that maybe we were conditioned by the calendar in which we live. It's profound how much we live in error in time. So cyclic time is right here, right now. In this present moment, there is always universal forgiveness. For God is most gracious, merciful, all forgiving. Can you imagine how forgiving this God is? Can you imagine we're still here? We're still alive on this planet. We've been given this little break, a little bit of time to still see if we can pull it off. The galactic epic of free will. Can we as a human species wake up in time to get it that we are meant to be intelligent? We are meant to know how to get out of the mess that we ourselves created by living in error in time. Every mother knows one of the main things she tries to teach her child is that if you make a mistake, try to learn from your mistake. Try to change your behavior so that you move forward in the right way. In the current world of the United States of America, there is no indication of anything being wrong, and there's not even any discussion about morality, that maybe there is a right way and a wrong way. We're all swimming in a soup that says that war is peace, that putting a SWAT gun in front of a child is the right way, that we're being right when we do this. We are a really hung up nation in the United States of America, we are absorbed in our own decadence. It's profound. It's shocking. We should all be very shocked. We should feel a little bit nauseated, a little bit sick, that this world is so out of order. So where is our humanness? Where is our heart? Where is our intelligence? It's something that only each person can find for him or herself. There's no one else that really can tell you anything. It's only for your own exploration. But that doesn't mean I did it my way. God's plan is vast, and it may or may not include letting the human species continue on this planet. It's not clear what the destiny of the future is, but certainly as long as we're all alive and breathing together 
And in the same space, we have an incredible opportunity to wake up. And maybe this week, because we're going to be intimately together for the, over the next six days, seven days in all, maybe we can find a way to actually fall in love in such a way that we can let this knowledge come into us and see how we might then spread this knowledge. But we're not naive. It's not up to us. Not in the way of our ego to say, oh, I'm Bolonic. Wow, I'm sitting in front of all of you. No, I'm even having to be filmed on this videotape. I'm even having to look over there and say, aha, look at that. We have learned to videotape every microsecond. We have learned to capture ourselves and to look at ourselves and to look at ourselves and to look and look and look and look and are we going to find anything this way? I don't think so. I still have always said the revolution will not be televised because I don't think that frequency is going to wake up the planet because sitting in front of your television set can really make you sick. Just like reading the newspaper every day, it can make you really sick. You can get really down. You want to read the paper? We noticed today, I think they serve up the newspaper here to the hotel rooms, about coming into the port of Portland from out of the country. We did it. We came back from Japan once and had to come through Portland. It is a police state, everyone. We live in a police state. We have never been greeted so badly as coming back into the port of Portland. So a sad statement, but we should feel kind of revulsed. We should really feel like maybe there is a need to start to speak out and talk to our neighbors. Maybe we are supposed to see if we can make a change. So we've certainly said enough for today. And there's much to think about and much to share. And I know you got started today in meeting with your Earth families. And the reason that the Earth family is the new social form is because according to the cyclic order, each one of us, by our date of birth, has a galactic signature. And it takes 52 years for us to move through 13 tones four times according to the four members of our galactic fa Earth family. So in this way, by meeting with your Earth family, you're meeting with yourself. You can't, you can't get mad at anybody because you've actually for each person in your own earth family, you've had a year of your life or you will have a year of a, your life that relates to that person. So truly, in, as the Native Americans say, all my relations, mitakwe oyasin, we are all one family. In Lakesh, I am another yourself. I am human, you are human. We are all human. We are all one human family. So your Earth family will be the time for you to discuss and to activate. So that will be all for today. And tomorrow, we'll present the law of time, the synchronic order. In the morning, the context. Time is the fourth dimension. And in the afternoon, we'll work with the dream spell. So tomorrow will be an active day for working in your Earth family. I'd also like to say that I know that there's a lot of people here who know something about this. And that the reason we're presenting this, we know that a lot of people here know something about this, okay? But the reason why we're presenting this is so that you might understand that it is a whole system and understand the whole system that it is and understand the basis of this whole system and the purpose of this whole system. And that is something that I just want to share and that I hope that you keep in mind and take to heart. So thank you and um, we'll see you tomorrow. We'll be continuing, uh, I think it's just very helpful